Welcome back to Talk of the Bay. I'm Christine Barrington in the studio with Amy Chen Mills, a fellow Talk of the Bay host to explore the latest in the rocky community process around the Cabrillo College name change. On August 7th, the Cabrillo College Board of Trustees will meet to decide on the possible new name for Cabrillo. The process began in June of 2020 with a petition of 100 people presented to the Board of Trustees, and the petition signers apparently were a collection of Cabrillo professors, students, and other internal voices from the college. After a deliberative and educative process, which included the voices of Indigenous tribes, students, and professors, the trustees decided to move forward on engaging the wider community with the intention to change the name. And this process started in November of 2022. Well, it is said that there's only one thing that's guaranteed when in a community, and that is conflict. And it's therefore best to learn how to harness conflict for wisdom and insight. Well, tremendous conflict has arisen in this community over the name change, and hopefully some valuable wisdom can be harnessed from the polarization that has gripped Santa Cruz around this issue. Amy and I joined in the last in-person community process around the name change, which was held last week at the Felton Library. I gathered interviews from participants, and we are going to listen to these um, insights from people around the county and then discuss the themes that arise from these community voices. So, um, Amy, thank you so much for joining me in the studio. You're the one that told me about this meeting, and it was so great to join you there. Thank you. Thank you for coming and recording and doing all that work. I thought it was actually a really great community meeting. I thought so, too, and a lot of the people that I spoke to felt the same and um, felt changed by it. And it just goes to underscore how important it is to get live into these spaces, interact with people face to face, get your questions answered. So um, very quickly, I I want to let our listeners know a little bit about Uh, what we experienced at this meeting. There were two trustees present, Christina Cuevas and Adam Spickler, and President Matt Wettstein was there. And uh, they did a whole PowerPoint, you know, presentation with lots of fabulous information. And one of the things they stressed was that the education code gives the elected trustees the responsibility to name the college, and that it's not a popular vote, and that they didn't do polling because of the expenditure that would be involved. However, they did engage about 1,500 respondents who put forward suggested possible names and then winnowed it down to 350, and then a community task force convened to sort through these possibilities. And they sorted, and now they came up with these five choices. Yeah. And, you know, people are very disconcerted in our community by the choices. And I understand that sometimes when you have a committee like that, you don't end up with the most spectacular name because their process was pretty democratic. There were a lot of people involved and there were a lot of votes and a lot of names that came in and they winnowed it down to some, you know, some decent names. You know, I don't think anybody's super thrilled, but they're fine. Like Aptos, people were struck by the name Aptos because... In Alone, it means the people. And people didn't know that. I didn't know that until this process started happening. And I know that from reading the report that was done by the uh, Board of Trustees at Cabrillo, which is on their website, which is the whole process of, that they went through, you've probably read that, um, you know, they really, they really tried hard to come up with names that were going to be representative of what they wanted to feature, like social justice, racial justice. Um, you know, how the community is taking it is a whole nother issue. <laughs> it's, it's a really big issue. And yeah. again, right, conflict is an opportunity for growth, for lessons, for wisdom. And we're going to get into some of that. And can you name the, the five uh, names? Yeah, let me see if I can remember. There's Seacliff. There's Costa Vista. There's Santa Cruz Coastal, I believe, College. Coast College. Yeah, yeah. Santa Cruz Coast. Okay, so just that shortened coast. And then also Cayastaca, which has been controversial because it'd be hard to pronounce, but a lot of people liked it. I did, and I was surprised that people liked it. And then also Aptos, yeah. which is then people in, I've heard that people in Watsonville don't like Aptos so much because it's sort of a little bit classist because it's a wealthier community. You know, people have a lot of... It was so insightful. I, yeah. I It just goes to show me personally yeah. what I don't know. Processes right. like this show 
us what we might not know if we engage. And I was amazed to learn that, yeah, people in Watsonville might not be so happy if the college is named Aptos because there's... So in one article, they said rivalry. I don't. I don't think that's an accurate word. But there's a sense that there's class divisions, and um, so that was really interesting to learn. Yeah. So I'm gonna uh, play because you know this is community radio, and I love getting you know community voices on. Yeah, so you're good at it. I want to start with um, the voice of Donna Meckis, and she was on the renaming commu- uh, committee. Just a sec here, and let me find her. Okay, here we go. My name is Donna Meckes, um, and I'm on the committee that is um, trying to narrow down the names and worked on the top five. And I'm getting worried about how divisive this is for everybody. What are you observing about the divisiveness? Tell me what you're seeing and, and what your concerns are. Okay. I've been in Santa Cruz all of my life. I worked at Cabrillo for 20 years. Um, I'm, I love this community. I love the county. My family's originally from Watsonville. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I've been reading everything. I've been, you know, I've watched all the videos from the historians. I have, um, I've, I've, I've listened, I've read all the comments. I've listened to what everybody's saying. And I, I'm worried about how we come out in a positive way on this because people are in such different places. So that was a pretty interesting community voice, given that she was on the committee and pretty positive about the process, but now she's feeling pretty worried and conflicted. Yeah, I, I, I myself have emotions about this, and I know that a lot of other people do. I, I want to point out, though, that it feels like we are the epicenter of the universe on this name change right now. But if you look at the report... They actually link to a Wikipedia page and a, an article from the Chronicle of Higher Education that lists all the name changes that have happened. And some I didn't even realize. These are happening without us even knowing. But like Dixie State University has become Utah Tech. Uh, Sir John Cross in the UK has become the International School of Art, Architecture, and Design because Sir John, Sir John Cass, I'm sorry, was involved in the slave trade. Uh, U- University of Southern Cal has changed the Von Kleismid Center for Public Affairs, International Public Affairs, to just the Center for International Public Affairs. The Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton, that name has been changed. That was my father's alma mater. So this is not unique to our community. Bolt Hall has been changed, and that was incredibly controversial. Some of these took years to get through and people changed their minds, went back, decided not to rename. And then a couple of years later, something happened around a racial incident like the killing of George Floyd. And then it was like, okay, now we have the public sentiment to do this. Hastings College of the Law is now UC College of the Law. And I was just learning this reading the report and part of the report and what the what the board wants to do and the committees want to do with this is to create a public education process. Why are we changing the name? And you, I think you were at Cabrillo when they were presenting some of these workshops. And I think that's the important thing is to not just have our knee jerk opinions, but to actually dive into this report, look at the webinars, listen to the indigenous people in our community who've been speaking to this and why they want the name change. Because I see us as a family and people in our family feel hurt. When people in your family feel hurt and abused, you don't override their voices in my mind. You, li- you listen, you say, well, what is it that's hurting you? And usually when you listen deeply you know, to another person, you change, you, your, your mind changes, your heart changes. And I know that happened for a lot of people during Black Lives Matter. It happened for me. I learned things I never knew by reading and joining book clubs and watching films. I mean, I really tried to educate myself. And I think that's what we need to do now. But I just wanted to point out that we're not the only college or university that has been changing the name, going through this tumultuous process. And it's, I think it's been tumultuous really everywhere. And there is a big age divide between people who are older, who are alum, who are donors, and students and younger people and faculty. Right. Yeah. Yes. And that brings up, um, in my mind, the article that Sandy Lydon 
just had an op-ed piece in the Sentinel. Someone at the meeting brought it up. He was pretty upset because he said the trustees had said that, you know, Sandy has something to answer for in this article. And he was like, tell me what he has to answer for. And they very carefully said, well, you know, that's not what this meeting's about. Right. And I, it made me really curious. And uh, so I, I read those pieces. And I thought there was a lot of, there's two pieces. And there was a lot of good stuff in there. And there was a lot of stuff that I'm like, wow, there's all kinds of things in here I don't know about. And so with when emotions run high in relationships, yeah, um, it's important for us to slow down. And so the thing, the one thing that not not necessarily saying, hey, we should we shouldn't be doing this name change process. But I think one of the points that Sandy brings up is the community wants to talk about this more. And I'm wishing that we could um, talk about it more and have more interactions for people to get educated. Because just that one meeting was really impactful for me. I, I was surprised at, at just, you know, encountering people from the board of trustees, encountering people that were for and against this name change. And I think people are needing more time to process it. But that's just an opinion I, as a community member. As that's an opinion. your opinion. Yeah. yeah, I know it's difficult. It's, um, I mean, on the other hand, sometimes my thought, and this is coming from my perspective as a person of color, and someone who's, I'm half white, and I've done this anti-racist education, right? So I'm trying to also have that sympathy. Um, you know, the majority here is not indigenous. The majority is probably white, I imagine. I think it's predominantly white in this community. The second biggest minority would be Hispanic, Latin A, right? In in the whole Santa Cruz mm -hmm. County. Right. So this is not, they're not going to have the votes. And at what point, because in the dialogue, it's to me, okay, I have this metaphor. This could be a terrible metaphor. I, it's the only thing I could come up with. It's like you have people sitting around at a table. It's a family. There's a patriarch. And there, there are young people, young adults in that family who've been very abused by this patriarch. Now, this is, I'm not saying anyone's a child or, you know, it's just a, a power structure that I'm trying to describe here. Mm -hmm, right. And the the younger people, they've been very abused a while ago by this patriarch, and they are being talked over in this dialogue right now. That's how I feel. You know, like, the patriarch is not listening and going on and on and on about this is what we need to do as a family. We're moving forward. We're making decisions. And these young people who are, you know, let's say indigenous people, how do they get into this conversation? How do they jump in? I, I've heard that, or the speculation is that outside of these very formal presentations and meetings with the board, they they are probably reluctant because I know as a Chinese American that when I was trying to talk to people in Pacific Grove about the Feast of the Lanterns, for example, I had people coming at me like with, you know, this is our tradition and how dare right, you and right. what about what you're going to tell us next? We can't serve burritos anymore. I mean, and it's it's right. called emotional labor. You get exhausted. Right. And it's, right. it's overwhelming. And so there's a part of me that feels like the conversation itself, like the patriarch may be yelling at everyone at the table or lecturing everybody or telling everybody without understanding the perspective of these younger people who've been abused. And they're not listening to, to him because they're like, we don't believe anything you say at this point. Like, we don't buy it. We've been hurt by you. Right. You know, it's like, how long does this person speak? And... Sometimes I'm like, maybe we, I feel like with these other name changes, probably at some point they just had to rip off the Band-Aid and move right. on. And that, and that would be a really interesting thing to know. But I hear your yeah. point about the, the emotional labor point is really important. And also the reluctance to speak up because it is so emotionally taxing to not be listened to. And But one of the things I think would be really beneficial yeah. at if, if there were more community meetings held, would be to play the recording of the presentation that the Native American uh, individuals and groups put together for uh, the college uh, board of trustees. Because I think if more people saw that presentation, and then those Native people don't have to say it over and over again, they put a lot of effort into producing that. And it's, it's, it can be found. 
um, there's a specific date. I think you're you looking it up. I'm looking at the report. So if you go to the Cabrillo College website, if you go to the name change section and you go to the report, there is a list. I believe these are all links mm-hmm. to these different presentations, the impacts of colonization on Native Americans from April of 2021. Uh, Dr. Iris Engstrand, who was Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. So the conversation I'm hearing is, and there are a few of these, there are six different presentations. The conversation I'm hearing is without having heard these presentations, without understanding the timeline for this and how people actually were surveyed, maybe not in a really extensive, expensive way, but students were surveyed, indigenous students were surveyed, faculty were surveyed, and there are majorities of faculty and a younger people under the age of 20 and indigenous people who support by majorities this name change. Um, I feel like the conversation is up here without the depth of hearing right. what what is the concern. Are people asking, well, what is the concern about Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo? And you may have talked to people who were at that meeting who were like, well, I mean, I heard them and I, I'm not blaming them because we've all come out of ignorance at some mm-hmm, point right. where they're saying, you know, like, well, what's the big deal? Why can't we just have the name and then have indigenous studies and talk about Cabrillo, you know, but then the name is a is a it's a mark of honor. It's a place of honor to, to name a college after somebody. Right. And uh, I'll, I'm going to play a clip from a woman that's pretty torn about these things. So here we go. I'm a, a white older person, but I grieve for indigenous people. I literally grieve for them. This building wouldn't be here if we hadn't all come from Western society and completely pushed them out and killed them and with disease and everything. I am not a bigot. I'm not a supremacist. Cabrillo is a name. It's a brand. It means quality. It means legacy. It means history. It means amazing teachers that people have benefited from all these years. That's what it means. There's no statue to this Cabrillo guy. I don't know his first name. There's nobody saying, we emulate you because, and we're naming a college after you because we think you're so great. It never happened that way. There was a Cabrillo Highway. It was a, it was a, uh, an explorer who came here, like Sir Francis Drake or anybody. We have Drake Collar. We have everything. I just have to say that, and I just think that um, this is like a runaway horse. It's like, um, you know, and I'm all for like taking down statues of Confederate leaders in town squares and things, but there's no statue here. There's a Cabrillo name, which means so much to so many. Now, sure, educate people about who this guy was, if he was ruthless and brutal, but there were a lot of them. There were a lot of them that were ruthless and brutal, and their names are all over this state. Thank you. So I think that's a pretty um, oft-heard kind of uh, expression, right? Like, uh, I do feel grief, and yet if we do this, like, how are we going to rectify all of these names, right? And people are are struggling with this. Now, I want to play another clip from a young woman, and um, she comes from a different perspective. So my name is Stacy Newsom Kerr. I'm a history teacher at Santa Cruz High School, and I think that this name change is absolutely necessary. We have gone through locally and nationally a reckoning over how we tell the story of history, um, especially since Black Lives Matter, but especially how history has treated the stories of non-white people in this country. And keeping a name like Cabrillo is a white supremacist nod to history. The reason why he has been seen as important is that he was, you know, a great discoverer and explorer. And because the Portuguese community wanted their guy in there to try and put themselves into, you know, the sort of local mythology and be important. This is the same thing that happened with Columbus and the Italian community kind of nationally, why we have Columbus Day, right? But we historically at least, among historians, and you can see this also reflected in the framework for the state of California, recognize that history is not exclusive to a white narrative. And the reckoning for this is what we're dealing with now kind of locally in this whole renaming 
debate, I guess, over Cabrillo. So I think it's hugely important that this go forward, and I'm excited that it is. So there were a lot of those voices at the meeting as well. There were there were more than I thought, given what I've seen in like local, mm-hmm. especially in the Sentinel comments. I would say that room, if I were to guess, was majority in support and just mostly talking about which name. Mm-hmm. And there was a minority of people who were opposed to the change. I mean, I want to say something about the one woman and, you know, bless her heart. Again, I've been, you know, I've had to educate myself. It's her perspective. It's not the indigenous perspective to look at that and say it doesn't matter that it's just the name on a college. Like, it is a, I mean, to name a college after someone is based, like Bolt, Bolt was someone who supported the Chinese Exclusion Act, you know, and so in San Francisco, which has a lot of uh, Chinese people, or is it Berkeley? Where, no, no, Berkeley. I, it's okay, Berkeley, right. We have a lot of Asians in the Bay Area, right? And so here's someone who was against Chinese Americans, wanted them out, wanted them kicked out, above all other, you know, ethnicities. And they change the name, you know, it's because if you are a Europe of European descent, a white person, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're hostile to indigenous people, but you will never understand the feeling of, oh, we have to live with these people who really created a genocide for us. You know, Jewish people talk about, I've had to think about what would it be like to have Goebbels on a, on a college. Mm-hmm. How is it, you know, that somehow we recognize that as being really harmful, but part of white supremacy is, oh, indigenous people, they're just all a blur of brown people who, who cares what happened to them, really, right? And that is the... (sighs) Yeah, I mean, I I was thinking about this today. Yeah, we write a lot of books, and we make a lot of movies about the Nazi driven Jewish Holocaust. That's right. All, and and they're interesting and they're powerful and i'm like how about we see a movie that portrays the reality that one of the first legislative acts that the state of california made was essentially an extermination order they put a price yeah. on the scalp of native people men women children can you imagine being hunted in your home where are you going to go you look indian like where are you going to go and so and we don't it it makes people so uncomfortable to talk about these truths now this the class i was taking at cabrillo when these meetings happened was native american studies where i was learning i already knew a lot and i there's so unfortunately so much more to learn now is this name change presented as a restorative process actually you're not going to be able to answer well i'm going to give you a minute and a half to answer this and <laughs> i haven't seen it being presented as kind of a restorative justice move honoring native americans i i don't see that sort of leading I the see. discussion. And yeah. if it did, I think then we could present like these materials and these stories and saying like, this is like you said, when we care about people in our community that are hurting and have been hurting for a long time, yeah. this is a way for us to say, we care about your feelings. We care about you. This is a way to just to make things right. I think we could lead more with um and I, you know, nothing's perfect. This has been an incredibly complex and deep process from what I've learned, uh, much more so than people think, it, it's starting in 2020. Um, but the Amamutsan tribal band uh, is among us, right? And as, as are other Ohlone people and Awaswa speaking descendants in this area, and they have spoken very clearly about this issue. Valentin Lopez, Chairman Lopez, is there figurehead and speaker for the Amamutsan tribal band. People don't always know that they are out doing restoration work in our area, in our county, doing controlled burns, cultural burns, um, bringing education and uh, and restorative justice issues to the forefront here. These are descendants of people who were at the Spanish missions as sort of indigenous, quote unquote, slaves, you know, workers, slaves, whatever, you know, people call these call these roles different things. Um, And so when there is a clear statement from them, this is what I said at the at the forum is, I am so concerned that if we end up not changing the name, for some reason, these people in our community who are trying to help Mother Earth for us on our behalf, not taking any money from us, I mean, people can donate, but it's not government money. 
Um, what it what does it mean ha- about how we feel about them and their voice? Right. You know, right. and so that to me is let's include everyone in our family. Let's listen and let's figure out how to heal. I love that. That's a beautiful note to end on. We're going to have to pivot to first person singular. Amy, thank you so much for coming in. You know, this is such a complex issue and process. And uh, may our community find a way to move forward together with compassion and understanding. Yes. Amen to that. Amen.